use use things like the uh, British pound the currency symbol because it's outside the text. So it doesn't make it so it just makes it text. Hello everyone. <laughs> so it's nice to get a little bit of a response when you said <laughs> hello. Um, so welcome to oh that's better. There we go. Thank you everyone. Um, welcome to Social Machines VII7. Seven. Seven. Okay. Uh, we have three lovely talks for you for um, closing up today. And we're going to be running for about an hour and a half, finishing around six. Um, so the first, first talk is going to be from uh, James and Trevor. The second is going to be um, on real time. So those guys are going to collaborate, hopefully, in real time. Um, so please welcome to the stage uh, James and Trevor who will be talking about the visual editor. Because I lived here, and I've never done this before, hello London. Uh, <laughs> so I'm James Forrester, I'm product manager for editing. That includes pretty much everything that changes content. Uh, so the Wikitext editor that everyone loves and knows, or maybe not. Uh, visual editor, which we're going to talk about mostly today, and a few other things. So, uh, if you have questions, feel free to shout them out, or we can ask them at the end, which is probably a little bit more respectful for time. Uh, so, last year, Trevor, who's uh, my lead engineer, and I, and every single one of the visual editor engineering team who wasn't relayed by sickness, came on stage and gave a really exhausting technical talk about how visual editing was really hard. And although it was very successful in helping people understand Visual Editor, it wasn't necessarily very interesting from the point of view of people who want to know about Visual Editor and don't really care what technology it uses. So I promise this talk is relatively light in terms of uh, technical stuff, and there's a follow-up talk that Trevor is giving with uh, Rowan tomorrow that has much more detail about the technology. I'm happy to answer questions now, but it might be more useful to ask later. So, what is Visual Editor, etc. This is kind of roughly what I'm going to run through very quickly. Overview. That's a little too much of an overview. What is Visual Editor? A rich web editor for anyone. That means uh, you can richly edit without having to uh, understand some arbitrary syntax. It creates HTML documents and web documents for pretty much any use. Um, it's pretty generic in Visual Editor, although uh, obviously there is also a MediaWiki extension that we know and love, which uh, pulls Visual Editor into MediaWiki and does a lot of refinements specific to MediaWiki, like references, like templates, like MediaWiki's interesting approach to images and so on. So right now, uh, it's available on all Wikipedias and has been for just over a year, available uh, in some form on every Wiki. I think 15 months, and um, some non-Wikipedias have requested it and uh, have got it as well. In terms of availability, 160 Wikipedias have it on opt-out. That means that if you have, are anonymous or you create a new account, you'll get Visual Editor available, and then there's 127 where it's opt-in. So we're more than halfway through the transition for it to be entirely opt-out, but there's still some way to go. And of that 127, the majority, uh, the vast majority, are languages which have uh, technical issues, is the polite term, with Visual Editor. And, but then there are four which are English, German, Dutch, and Spanish, where the communities have uh, temporarily asked us not to deploy it there. Oh, sorry, not to deploy it in opt-out status. So that's what Visual Editor is. But the more interesting question is why, why are we spending so much effort, so much time, and so much uh, potential fuss in creating Visual Editor? So the drop in new contributors is you know, the major issue. I've written a major issue here because I like to suggest that there are other issues that other people have to deal with as well. Um, MediaWiki is based on 
uh, quite hilariously rich, rich wiki text syntax, which although is very expressive in terms of ultra power users being able to write documents that do amazing things, you know, chessboards that move with a command, uh, it doesn't necessarily allow new people to easily join our community. And new people joining our community is vitally important, not just because we have an ever increasing amount of uh, content to patrol, to improve and to uh, grow, but also because we want new uh, opinions, new voices, and as the web grows, we need to grow with it. Um, and uh, Wikitext in particular, but a number of our existing editing tools prevent us uh, uh, through technical debt, through uh, the way they work, from actually um, providing more useful, helpful editing tools to our users. And that's not really appropriate. That's not what we're about. And as product manager for editing, I care about our users. I hope everyone cares about our users, but I'm going to say that it's all me. Um, so I'm going to throw to Trevor now, who's going to talk about, um, oh yeah, what this looks like. Here is reading mode. Here is wiki text mode. They bear no relation to each other. And then this is what visual editor looks like. So it's really deliberately similar to the reading mode. And the idea is to get pretty much identically to the reading mode, although with you know an editing toolbar. So that's what visual editor um, kind of is in in theory. And Trevor's going to talk about the changes in the last year or so. Thank you, James. <clears throat> uh, as he's mentioned a couple times, my name's Trevor. Trevor Pascal. Um, and uh, who loves really big grand and bailings and things? Anybody? Okay, well, none of that's going to happen today. <laughs> the, way, the way things work is very opposite to the way things work at like Apple. So we, basically we're just going to tell you everything we already did. So you, if you've been paying any attention, you probably already know all this. But maybe this will provide some extra context and maybe you weren't exposed to some of the things and maybe we can fill in a little bit of the gaps. So, um, yeah, so we release pretty frequently. This, uh, this t-shirt I'm wearing was like made when we released uh, for the first time as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, like available on English Wikipedia as an experimental thing. And then every single time that we release, we get new t-shirts. But then we switched to this release schedule. So now we just have to make t-shirts like randomly. So you don't really have any big things. And um, Basically, we, we focused a lot on citations because the, the, the real objective that we have early on here is to try and get people to create content that will stick. And it turns out that when people create unreferenced content, that seems to get deleted really fast. So we really wanted people to be able to create references. We had an early version of a reference uh, tool, but they weren't really using like SiteWeb, SiteBook, things like that, which are really useful for creating references the, the nice way, and they render out the way that the community wants them to. So we really focused on trying to provide people these, these avenues to do things the right way. And also to be able to discover that this isn't just sort of like a bracket to, but this is a reference to a book in particular. Um, so our context menu now gives you a little bit of information. We're actually working to make it so that instead of it just saying book, it'll actually show you the reference right there, or at least a, a, a bit of it, to give you some context of what's behind that too. Tell you something you don't already know. And so when you edit that thing, we expose the parameters, just like editing a template. Um, and this makes it so that the users don't necessarily have to worry about all the details of formatting. Same thing that Wikipedia editors have already been doing for a very long time. Uh, but we're just trying to make this more accessible to entry level people. And um, there's, always, there's always more uh, fields available in these templates. We try to keep it to only showing the ones that you actually are using currently. And you'll see that there's a list of a few here and then there's a um, hundred and seven more. <laughs> What's amazing is that all of these, we actually created this thing called template data where the community could describe all the different parameters of the templates. Uh, so we didn't do all that ourselves. We just made the infrastructure for it and then they went to town. So like all of these um, descriptions and these nice uppercase names and everything like that, that is all written by the community and we just expose it in our user interface. It's a very flexible system that, um, that we can generate inter user interfaces around. Um, so I, I, think, I think pretty much the thing that we came to is that we built a template editor first, which you could technically make citations with, but then we tried to wrap like a bit more nicety around it to make it so you didn't realize you were editing a template, you were just working with a, with a citation. But 
Because of that simplification of citations, we actually ended up pushing that into template editing. So even when you're just editing a template, you already have this <coughs> simplified um, uh, experience with just like a, a, a list of, of things. The, the, previ the previous experience was uh, more paginated and it was more complex. If you click on the show options button, you still get like a really complex experience. You can do all kinds of crazy things, multi-part templates, whatever. But uh, we're just trying to get people away from the chaos and, and keep them focused on the task at hand. Um, and so the, I, I'm not sure what this was. What are you doing here? <laughs> well, I guess, okay, I think that the, the point is, is like, we're trying to expose a lot more information of what's happening here. So when you click on something that has meta information about it, like it's in a different language or it's linking somewhere, we're trying to tell you where it's linking or what language it's in. And um, also we're now finally supporting HTML comments, uh, which is a big problem because people in the community would put comments like don't change Barack Obama's birthplace or something like that. And then people would come along in a visual editor and they wouldn't see any of those notices and then they would go and change it and not really realize how much people were like uppercase mad at them uh, for doing so. <clears throat> and uh, and yeah, and so we've also been working really closely with the mobile team. Uh, they really deserve all the credit for like forging ahead on that. Uh, but we've been trying to do everything we can to support them. And so we're like, I think more officially pushing that out. It's been in like a beta mode and we're getting that a little bit more stable. Um, so that you'll be able to use Visual Editor with some some limited feature set and some user experience sort of adjustments on mobile. But the big the big push has really been to take everything that they've been doing on mobile and just bring it right back to desktop. Um, admittedly, we didn't do mobile first on this project. Um, although we were thinking really far ahead and that's one of the reasons we switched uh, around some of the technologies that we're using is to, to accommodate mobile in the future. But we really were focused on desktop first. Uh, but now that we're actually getting to mobile, we're just trying to learn as much as we can from them and just dispose of all the, the, the antiquated desktop uh, ap approaches to solving every problem and pretty much just take on the mobile approaches instead. And so this is the way it, this is the way it looks. It's um, one, of the, one of the things you can tell is that the where it says website, like right underneath, that's actually like this, that's the equivalent of that little pop-up that comes underneath whatever you're clicking on. In mobile, the text selection it's sort of right there, so we had to move that away. Um, but it's essentially the same controls, the, the same mechanisms, we just kind of put them in different places. And um, most of all, once we, got, once, once we got on mobile, we realized uh, that we really had a, a, lot, a lot of work to do with performance because the devices have so much less power uh, and they have, their own, they have their own sort of performance characteristics, limited memory, things like that. And uh, we've been working really hard to make the editing experience on mobile um, not just like nice on a really, really awesome mobile, mobile device, but maybe even on things that are smaller, like a phone, which is what we're headed towards in the near future. Uh, we do have some plans. Um, so there's been some work with the GSOC student, uh, Marielle, and she's done a really amazing job at making, so you can just like create a reference automatically using a using a ISBN or some kind of piece of information like that. That's, being routed through an external service called Zotero, and then we can just automatically generate things and give the users um, just just like a lot of convenience. And um, there's also been a really amazing amount of work that we actually just discovered this conference um, that's been done by, and now the name slips me. Substance IO, I'm sorry. Um, and they basically just built a table editor in VE Core uh, and you know, I think that we're just going to be working closely with them to get that brought into to the mainline uh, development stream, and just like uh, that's a whole other that's a whole other presentation that I, you know I blew my mind when they showed it to me. But it's excellent table editing, and I'm really excited about how far they've already come, and it's going to be coming a lot sooner than we thought. And um, the other thing is, you may have noticed in those uh, in those screenshots that you're still using WikiText inside the temple parameters. Um, for very simple uses of like convert or something like that, you probably never be exposed to it and hopefully users right now aren't too confused by it. But there is this weird dichotomy of like you're in visual editor but you're not really in visual editor and we're looking forward to getting rid of that. Uh, the parser support is pretty much there but we have to redo a lot of other um, things in infrastructure that have made assumptions about those things being plain text. 
but event, eventually what you're going to be able to do is edit each of those parameters also has um, uh, rich content. And then you can kind of do inception with like a template inside of a template inside of a template and crash your computer and it'll be really fun. Um, and, uh, and I think, I think too, yeah, just, just, I think we're trying to, we're trying to make it easier to not just like include media on visual editor, although I think that we've come a long way and that's, that's actually gotten really good. Um, but also be able to contribute and make sure it goes to the right places and has the right meta information. Um, and if you've ever used WordPress, uh, a lot of times the, the workflow is much more comfortable to start editing something and then introduce your images mid-edit. Whereas in MediaWiki right now, we kind of have this, uh, let me go do some other task on the side to create the image and then let me get the image and bring it in. And, um, and that's really uncomfortable for people. And then uh, finally, at least for this slide, I, I think that we're really trying to figure out ways to avoid people losing their work. Um, there's two reasons why people lose their work. Maybe they have a bad connection or computer, or maybe visual editor crashes on them. Um, and in either case, we really want to, to reduce the chance that they've like made this brilliant edit that we never get, or that they're so frustrated that they never give us another chance. Um, Roan Katow, who's here in the front row, has, has been assigned the absolutely horrid task of getting Visual Editor to work better on Internet Explorer. <laughs> you should give him a high five when you see him. He could tell you some horror stories. <laughs> and um, that's been, uh, that's been uh, slow and steady work. I think that we're going to be able to achieve some Internet Explorer support for the, the entire feature set. But as always with Internet Explorer, uh, then the version number that you're targeting <laughs> keeps getting uh, bumped up. Uh, <laughs> and by the time that you actually support it, that version is no longer supported by Microsoft. So uh, I think it's just an iterative process, but we, we are trying to take it pretty seriously. It's still, it's still a factor in market share browser-wise, especially for us. And, um, and we're, yeah, that, that's coming along better. And uh, David Chan is working on IME stuff and has come up with like a lot of really brilliant uh, brilliant ways of understanding what the browser's doing when I'm pretty sure the browser doesn't even understand what it's doing. <laughs> and uh, we, we're getting really close to having a really nice, safe way of inputting in pretty much any language that your operating system can throw at us. Um, I think that we have okay support in most cases, but this, will, this, this work is really gonna change it. And, um, and uh, hopefully, the, hopefully Visual Editor, especially in some of the smaller languages where it's actually being deployed as default, <laughs> will, um, will be a little more comfortable for people to use, less error prone. Um, and hopefully we're gonna, uh, I guess we're planning on expanding the, the number of projects where we are default. I think that there was a bit of a premature release the other year, and uh, we sort of shied away from that and sort of regrouped and tried to think about like, the feedback that we got really critically. It's really easy to be like offended, like they don't like us. But I think that people had really good points about like why it wasn't quite ready. And it, and it wasn't even just about the technology, but it was about the feature set. And and the likelihood of people being able to use that feature set to make constructive edits, like I was making references to when I was talking about references. And, uh, I, and I think that we've really come a long way um, in, in those in those areas, and we've already gotten a lot more positive positive response from those very same people, and others who are starting to start uh, you know use it as their secondary editor or even primary editor, whereas before they were pretty much just rejecting that space. Um, so yeah, pretty much our big goal is like deploy to the major Wikipedia's, and that's the toughest crowd to please, and we're we're. Uh, we're still not quite there, but I think uh, we're, we're getting really close. And then, you know, trudging along. Ron will have to keep working indefinitely. And, uh, and the rest of us will have to keep trying to keep everything fast. Um, I'm gonna pass it to James to continue on. So, um, given we are the editing team, I should probably talk about things that aren't visual editor just to balance. I mean, I don't care about them as much as visual editor because it's my baby. But, you know, other people do as well. So, um, there's in fact a roadmap about the editing team. The roadmap has no plans 
In fact, it is my attempt to list all the things that are editing. I got to 49 pieces of code, uh, extensions, and pieces of MediaWiki before I kind of put my hands up in the air and said, I'm going to need to talk to some people about that. But good news, I'm going to Wikimania. So one of the things that I really want is actually input on the things you would like to see change about the editing tools you use today, or the tools that you can't use today because they don't work for you, or because they don't exist. Um, that said, we're really, really seriously looking at improving the footnote system, so the extension for citations, which doesn't do citations or references, um, but never mind. Uh, so right now it's a bit of a mess. We've done the first big change to that extension for, I think it was three years, by removing the need to actually put a references block in the page, it will just put a references list in there for you if you forgot, rather than give you a nasty red error warning saying you didn't put it in, we will just put it in. Thank you. <laughs> that, that was the easy part. <laughs> Um, there's a lot more to change around that, um, and there's been some really fruitful discussions here, and I'm sure there will be more about what more we can change. Rationalizing wiki, uh, wiki editor and his apples fun, dear Chrome. Just somewhere that you should be right now? Yes, <laughs> turns out I'm being reminded that I need to go to Eric's presentation that's going to follow this one. <laughs> Ain't that fun? So the wiki text editor that everyone thinks is the wiki text editor is not the wiki text editor, it's an extension written by that man and several other people. Don't shoot. Don't you say. Um, and there is another Wikitext editor inside MediaWiki because we didn't delete it yet. Um, and this is silly because some people get confused and lots of people aren't in a very good position. So we need to rationalize down our code. It creates a lot of uh, bugs and unnecessary pain. Um, there are things that the English Wikipedia has pioneered using relatively hacky but you know successfully working tools like the edit notice system. So on English Wikipedia, the edit notice system lets you put a notice above a specific page or a category of pages. In MediaWiki, it lets you put it above pages in the namespace or all pages. Those are very different levels of functionality, and I think um, it'd be really useful to actually put that in MediaWiki core so that A, the English Wikipedia doesn't have to um, keep maintaining a hack, and B, all the other wikis that want that functionality can get it. But actually, a good way of editing those edit notices and not happening to know that you can use this template with this parser function and then it might work unless you have to cross your fingers and spit twice. Um, and there's a huge amount of code quality work. Uh, quite a lot of the code we've taken all the responsibility for has, has sat uh, in a slightly dusty position on the, on the sofa, uh, ignored by many people. And um, it needs some love and attention. And the, uh, the math, math, which I'm going to say maths, because I can't speak math, is um, the math extension is uh, supported by volunteers. They have some great plans which are at that roadmap, and one thing we're going to do is help them uh, and make sure that that actually comes to fruition. Um, mostly, currently, that's focused on things like editing in MathML rather than in LaTeX and displaying in such and whizzy fun things like that. Possible longer term changes. So this is really kind of focused on the next year, which is our primary kind of horizon for changes, our primary way of looking at uh, uh, the future. But there's a lot of things that we could do. And some of them, we maybe even should do. And some of them, specifically this one, is gonna be talked about next. So I won't spoil it too much other than flag up, but real-time collaborative editing is a really interesting idea and a huge amount of work. So. If you all get really enthused by Eric and Scott, um, good, I think. Um, arbitrary annotated comments. So right now we've, we've kind of implemented HTML comments in Visual Editor. They're used in Wikitext editing, but they don't actually apply to a, a bit of content. You can't say this comment is about this paragraph. You can only, it's only where it is. And in fact, it's not just uh, uh, not really right, but you can't have a proper discussion. We could build a really proper system based on that. Um, and flow and pathway between them are going to give us the building blocks that we could do something interesting in that area, rather than have people have a discussion through uh, revert warring each other. Maybe they could have an actual discussion using a system that's built for that. Mid-edit modification of Wikidata. So I've been slightly um, trumped by a user community gadget on Russian Wikipedia 
um, that has been sent around the list um, that does mid-edit modification of Wikidata, um, or actually mid-read modification of Wikidata, which is pretty cool. Um, there are some kind of issues about the Wikidata community in the same way that the Commons community um, has its own rules and policies, and you know, just because you're on Finnish Wikipedia doesn't mean that Finnish Wikipedia's policies apply. But that's something that we need to work out. Structured references apply to selections of content. Right now, it's really hard to determine whether references um, apply to the paragraph, the sentence, the word, or the full stop just before the reference, or maybe the one after it, or maybe a different thing. Uh, and that's really understandable because the current system doesn't really support anything like that. Structured means that we'd be able to do things like, hey, this book now has a second edition. Let's go look at all the pages in all wikis that, where the first edition was used to support a comment and make sure that it's still there in the second edition. Or, hey, there's a book near you in your local library that, that you know claims these things. Do you want to go validate that it actually does? Top to bottom language support, because I thought I'd put difficult things on this list. Uh, top to bottom language support is not necessarily impossible. In, in fact, Visual Editor itself natively uses browser stuff, and those generally-ish support top to bottom languages. We've got an example page using Mongolian Bati, which is a top to bottom right to left script, because, you know, why have only one complexity? And um, that works pretty well, um, right up to the point where you want to do anything in Wikitext. So um, if we're going to support top to bottom scripts, and that's a bigger conversation than just for me to shout about, uh, we really need to talk it through with a bunch of people um, who will want their language better illustrated, whether that's in Cantonese or in Mongolian Bati or lots of other languages. And I always put this one, every presentation I do about visual editors' future, I say sheet music editing um, for two reasons. One, because it's impossibly hard. It's crazily insane. There is no software out there that fully implements sheet music editing. Even the $2,000 professional stuff then gets manually tweaked. And two, because I put it in to see if anyone's listening. Uh, <laughs> um, but that said, we've got a bunch of musicians on the editing team. We've got a bunch of musicians in the community. Sheet music is one of these really big opportunities that I think is kind of sitting on the table. The score extension is impressive in the fact that it exists at all, but it really doesn't go very far, and the editing interface is uh, poor or woeful uh, because it's based on a very precise typesetter's way of editing uh, sheet music rather than a human way or a musician's way. And um, playback as you're, you're editing, so you can actually dum dum da dum 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 dum. No, no, dum dum da dum 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 dum. Perfect. You know that kind of stuff, which a visual editor lets you do, and um, editing LaTeX really doesn't. And that's visual editor. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Any at all? Yep, there's one there. Is there a mic? Uh, I'm not sure there's a roving mic, but if you speak a question, I'll shout it back. Yeah. Um, Adam, I was talking about your science. We were behind the example of the uh, table editor and the equation. What we're interested in is the scope of the battery for us. But you didn't mention that here is the best thing for third party players. Because the editor is very interesting as an outsider of the world. Yeah, so the question was about third party plugins for Visual Editor. Uh, so Visual Editor is actually a standalone uh, editor, not tied to MediaWiki. It's not tied to pretty much anything other than our own libraries and jQuery. And it has uh, this great flexibility, but that means that other people who are not Wikimedia and even are not MediaWiki based will want to use it, as Adam is an example of. And so one of the things that we've made really important in our development of Visual Editor is the ability to have third parties come along and add their own plugin for Visual Editor that lets them do crazy things. And some of them might be so crazy that we go, that's interesting. And others are the, that's brilliant, and we want it on MediaWiki right now. And you know, I'm sure there'll be a balance between them, but uh, we'd really like to help support an ecosystem of uh, extensions, plugins, call them what you will, for Visual Editor rather than have, uh, certainly we don't want all of that developed by us, because we're not going to be able to have that time. Is there always going to be a markup at the bottom of the, um, uh, the, the um, page, so the sort of history will also see markup changes, and also so the security entry, or is it 
So the question is about, yeah, the question was about um, uh, markup and whether there's always going to be a markup editor, and in particular whether there's always going to be a markup at the bottom of the editing chain. Um, so I would say yes and no. Um, there's always at least <clears throat> I have definitely do not have any plans of getting rid of markup. Um, the position it holds in the chain and whether what's served in the database is actually the HTML or the wiki text is a kind of different question and Parsoid has um, some really great plans uh, to actually use HTML in the database. But I don't think we're going to get rid of, of wiki text editing. Um, certainly it would be crazy to talk about that right now. We have one more question, sorry. Love it, love it. Any plans for a visual browser? What does that mean? Uh, what's a visual browser? I would like to see um, matrix network diagrams that I can browse and mm -hmm. move around and move through the content. Oh, ah, interesting. So the question was about uh, a visual browser, something r related to uh, uh, graph walking inside Visual Editor. Um, no plans. That but. sounds fascinating, and I think that goes under the talk to me if you want uh, some great tool I that think, we haven't put I in. think there's a good chance we could do it just before we do music. <laughs> cool. right. Thank you very much, everyone. Time for the next video. James and Trevor. Next up will be Eric and Scott after a brief interview. You can see that Visual Editor has really, really come an awesomely long way. Um, I think when when it launched uh, in, in in the last year, at that point, what we were able to demonstrate is that it is possible to visually edit wiki text, which in fact um, nobody actually had really credibly demonstrated before. Um, so I think um, that uh, that demonstration and that uh, initial deployment was a very, very important and sort of putting our foot in the door and saying we can do this. Uh, we can build a visual editor while still operating on, on wiki text underneath. Um, but as Trevor pointed out, especially for users of the large Wikipedia with very complex content at that time, it was really not something that users could use um, effectively to compose or edit those articles at that level of complexity with appropriate robustness uh, and, and a, a delightful user experience. We're now at the point where users are telling us um, I am using this thing, it's starting to get there, it's starting to be capable and powerful as a tool for editing really complex content. And that's a very rewarding experience to get that kind of feedback. Um, but where we really want to get with the editor is to the point where users will tell us, this thing makes me happy. Um, this thing makes me happy every day that I'm using it. And we're starting to work on the kinds of features that make people happy. And the, the citation feature that James mentioned where you just put in the link and it magically creates the footnote with all the information for you. That's the kind of feature we know will make people happy. And there'll be a lot more of those, making it fast, making it really intuitive to switch into edit mode, making it really nice to use on mobile, potentially adding things like in-place editing, all those kinds of features we know have the potential to make people really happy. So we're crossing that line now where we're starting to be able to make users happy. Now, one thing that I'm very excited about in the longer run um, is um, leveraging these technologies, not just for editing as a single person, um, but um, working with others in partnership. Um, and the reason I'm excited about this is I've always felt 
that Wikipedia is alive. Uh, Wikipedia started out as a project that demonstrated and pioneered um, that people were working together in real time. And I think we often forget that when we look at the sort of most modern real-time collaboration tools that exist today, um, that Wikipedia actually was the first um, real, real-time collaborative editing environment, even though it was a very poorly built one <laughs> um, by the standards that we have now. Uh, it, it still was, uh, was a very powerful one when it launched. Um, so, and we, we can still see this in, in the edit histories of many articles. So if you look at an article like the 2014 pro-Russian unrest in Ukraine on the English Wikipedia, and then what would you see here, you, you see the sequence of edits that are minutes apart, sometimes seconds apart, um, by different people, not the same person. Um, uh, in this uh, case, a small group of people, sometimes you have a larger, more diverse group of people. Um, what you'll notice actually are these little hints that people leave each other sometimes in the edit summaries, like, please be careful, you just undid my whole edit. So people sort of step on each other's feet by accident as they are operating on this, this page. Um, but they're also fighting with each other a little bit because uh, it's a contentious topic. And so someone adds something and someone else says, no, no, uh, like, I don't think this is really right and I'm removing it. So these, these sort of very quick, um, not quite edit wars, but conflicts and disagreements unfold almost in real time um, in, in an article like this one. And we also have a long history of using chat to augment the editing experience. Um, uh, in Wikipedia, the first ISC channel, I believe, um, was the Wikipedia, Palm Wikipedia channel on Freenode, uh, launched in 2001. Um, but since then, it's been expanded um, by many, 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 many IRC channels um, uh, for many languages and projects to a high level of specialization. Um, a very old technology, um, but one which has been uh, supporting Wikimedia as a movement for a very long time as well. And what you'll notice in these lists of IRC channels is that a lot of them have this annotation saying logging is prohibited. So I see as sort of a uh, not quite official medium in the Wikimedia universe. It's something that uh, functions as kind of a back channel uh, for communication among participants uh, in a project. And you're not, in most cases, supposed to be using it to make actual decisions uh, regarding edits, but you're sometimes using it to talk about the decisions and to, to chat with others. Of course, whether that actually is the reality um, always is another question. Um, but chat is there, uh, chat is there, and you have these very real-time interactions that are happening on chat, and you have these very real-time interactions that are happening on the wiki, they're just not very well supported. So we did a little bit of an analysis on, um, uh, actually I should give full credit, Eric Softer did a little bit of analysis on um, what kinds of articles um, typically receive um, high velocity of, of edits that are next uh, to each other, so uh, people really um, um, working on the same page with like one edit followed immediately by another within a few uh, seconds or minutes. And I'm, I'm just going to ask you, uh, what, what do you guys think, um, what's the, the most likely to, to be subject to high velocity editing? Is it any one of these? All of them. All of them. Well, which, which one of these do you think is number one? You think? I'm hearing a lot of disasters. I'm hearing a lot of deaths. And it's not any of them. It's that's just a combination of both. This these these ones in the, in the, in the <laughs> Beth in Texas, that's right. Now the, the, these ones are, are the ones that, that really get the most sort of high frequency editing, and it kind of makes sense when you think about it. Um, like when you're watching a movie or a sports event, um, you have lots and lots and lots of people often watching the same thing around a very uh, narrow time window, um, like the World Cup or a movie that's, that's just out, and they want to add the plot summary or they want to uh, describe the result um, and the sort of um, sequence of events uh, in a sports event. And that's actually where, where people often step on each, in, in each, each other's toes or they, they work together and, and uh, very closely adjacent to each other. Politics is, is, is the other um, big case of that, uh, where you have an election, a political event, uh, like the, the Ukraine situation, uh, a major conflict. Disasters, fortunately, uh, are just not um, that frequently occurring um, at, that, at such an order of magnitude that you have uh, so many people editing uh, at the same time. And when I looked at this, this sample of articles, 
I didn't find many cases where um, sort of the, the primary cause of a lot of high velocity editing was the fact that people were fighting with each other, but I did see some fighting with each other in almost all those cases, fighting in a sort of, um, um, is a bit of an, exagger an exaggerated term, but the, the kind of thing that you saw early in the edit history where someone says, I don't really think that's right, and they sort of step on each other's toes a little bit. So you do see that a lot um, in these, these high velocity articles. How many of you, so this is an edit conflict screen, um, you, you're not going to make it out now, even from the first row. Um, how many of you guys have ever encountered an edit conflict um, when editing a wiki? It's such a pain in the neck, right? It's a terrible user experience. You actually get this huge screen, you have to scroll all the way down, um, where in the middle you see the difference between someone else's version and your version, and you have to manually merge, merge the changes. And due to a mid-air collision that someone submitted a change while you were still in edit mode on the same page, the software tries to magically solve it for you, um, but if you are happening to be in the same place, um, it's, it's not going to work for obvious reasons. It just can't. And so the way MediaWiki has solved this is the way sort of uh, the open source community has solved it before with software, where you have to like manually merge changes. But of course, when you have the ability to work together in real time, uh, you have a better potential solution for this problem. Now, how frequently do we see this? Um, so the actual numbers, um, thank you to Dario Tarbarelli and Ori Livne for pulling this together for me. Um, these are numbers from July. And um, basically, this, this is the total number of edit conflicts on English Wikipedia in July, about 120,000. And uh, more than 20,000 uh, users and uh, registered users encountered, uh, encountered uh, a conflict. Uh, more, uh, more than that, uh, uh, like something like another 30,000 uh, IP users encountered a conflict. And these are the kinds of articles, again, it's, it's very similar uh, kinds of articles as the ones that we looked at before, sports articles, the, and the FIFA-related articles, the Gaza conflict-related article, Twitch, um, I didn't look at it um, yet, but I think it's probably the acquisition. Um, that happened around that time. And so we know that there are patterns for um, doing collaboration in real time now. Um, Google Docs is probably uh, the most well-established one now. Uh, Etherpad is widely used within the open source and free culture community, and there are many other solutions now that incorporate these real-time editing patterns. And Google, Google Docs in particular has pretty sophisticated mechanisms, not just for editing, but also for chat um, and for uh, annotating uh, in the margins. As you can see here, I can sort of select any piece of text, leave a comment, and I can reply in that thread, and the issue can be resolved uh, once it's resolved. They recently added a new uh, feature uh, that's represented by this little pencil icon up here, where you can just type in the document, and uh, without having to write a comment, you can implicitly suggest an edit, and it just gets highlighted as a comment without you having to do it um, yourself. So these are very sophisticated and, and powerful features, but they're built for a very specific use case, which is not our use case, um, which is if you have a select group of people um, who know each other, generally trust each other, and, and work together in good faith, um, and they know that they want to be working in this mode. And this is not necessary, like all these like, criteria don't necessarily apply um, when you introduce real-time collaboration into a wiki. So um, Pau Giner, a senior UX designer who was at the hackathon but couldn't be at the main conference this year um, for personal reasons, um, worked on some um, very uh, um, compelling uh, design studies um, for real-time collaboration that I'm going to walk you through. And uh, Pau is P. Giner at Wikimedia.org if you want to shoot him a note about um, anything in, in this stack. So what, what he's illustrating here is a workflow um, that actually incorporates multiple ideas, not just around real-time collaboration. If you uh, heard my talk two years ago about affiliation and wiki projects, you may recall that one of the things that, uh, as the foundation, we're very interested in is how we can get users to affiliate with each other effectively to collaborate on topics of shared interests. And in uh, many Wikimedia projects, we have this notion of wiki projects where users sign up and say, I'm interested in Project X, many other users are interested in the same project, let's coordinate um, and identify issues of shared concern, articles that we want to work on together. Now, 
one of the things that I hope we as a foundation will be able to work on is to actually give wiki projects proper software support rather than just treat them as flat pages uh, without any underlying functionality. And one such software feature, other than sort of the obvious list of members uh, that you can see here, uh, and this less obvious notion that you might have even like a list of people who are willing to mentor other users, is, is this notion that you could start an actual real-time collaboration through a wiki project. You actually land on a, on a wiki project and you decide, I want to start a new wiki project activity right now. Uh, I want to work on expanding this article about this asteroid, which happens to be named after Wikipedia. And I want to expand it and, and get some people, um, like either an entire group of people, like the wiki project astronomy, or an, a specific user, um, I want to invite them to join. Um, so you could use this as a sort of launching um, point. And let's say we have another user uh, named Jane who actually joins this session. Um, so we would have a little uh, affordance here that helps the user discover that there's an activity underway that they can be part of. And now you uh, start working in this real-time collaboration mode. One thing that Power is experimenting with here is that if there's an edit that might not be coming through the real-time mode, but that actually might be made through the traditional um, editing interface, it could even be highlighted um, as well while the real-time session is happening. It could be brought into the real-time session. So it's an interesting notion. It's a bit complex, but I think it's an interesting idea to play with. Um, so the notion here is that you have multiple users, and you are familiar with this from um, from Google Docs and other editing interfaces, I'm sure, um, and they are sort of indicated by uh, with these little guiders that identify the names, and you can see who's uh, editing at the same time. Um, and potentially there would be like a, a simple way to, to just click on an icon and then see the, uh, the folks who are um, either have been recently active on this document in general and the ones of those um, who are currently online. And you could start a chat session, bring other people into the um, real-time collaboration session and invite folks to join. Now, as, as you saw in the, the Google Doc um, screenshot uh, earlier, when you're collaborating with others, um, you really don't uh, want the conversation to be completely detached uh, from, uh, from the document, especially if it's more uh, something that's really relevant to the current collaboration that you're in. So um, Power is indicating here that one thing that we could do is um, actually have the discussion integrated um, into um, the editing interface and you can easily see what's going on and join any of those conversations right from the editing UI. Similarly, you could switch into the history mode and have different ways of navigating uh, the sequence of changes in the document, uh, what's happened recently, um, but also um, who is responsible for what. Like you see a, a, what's called a blame map um, of edits, like the, the actual attribution of edits to um, different people. Click a username and see them with cause like purple and, and blue, uh, who's contributed what to a specific edit and the sequence of edits that have recently taken place. So, all of this really challenges some of the fundamental assumptions about how wikis work right now. Um, if you've ever worked with a Google Doc um, and you've ever looked at a version history in a Google Doc, it's not fun. Um, version histories in Google Docs kind of suck to actually find out when anything happened and why is incredibly difficult because it doesn't really have the notion of a transaction where you explicitly save the document. It does it for you all the time in the background. And so all you really have is these timestamped uh, transactions which don't indicate any sort of uh, reasoning, rationale, and just basically says it happened at this time. Um, and these are the people who were involved at that time. And that's That's very, very tough to navigate. Um, at the very least, when you edit uh, a page in, in, in real time with multiple people, you have to indicate provenance somehow. Um, you have to, uh, the most basic thing to do is to just smash the, the authors into the, to stash them into the edit summary, which is kind of awful. Um, so really, you would ideally want to change MediaWiki so that it supports a one-to-many relationship between a version and authors, uh, which it currently does not, and to then display that relationship consistently in the interface. Um, but again, it's very tricky in this real-time collaboration mode to even 
defined consistently and clearly what a version is. Uh, at what point do you save the document? Um, how do you do a transaction? And likely you would still want to have some kind of explicit transactioning or at least uh, a description of the session that is happening uh, so that the system can then do the transactioning for you in a manner that is not completely opaque to someone who is then later trying to understand um, what happened at that time. You'd also have to deal with people joining a session who are not wanting to coll collaborate in good faith. Now, when we um, uh, have bad faith contributions in other contexts, we ban the user. Do we then need um, the blocking interface to be directly integrated um, into the editing window? Do we need to call for an admin emergency panic button? Like, <laughs> there might be mechanisms that we have to develop just um, to deal with the openness of the system uh, that is unique to our editing environment. And I think we'll have to accept that many users will not use this system um, ever, uh, not just in the next year or in the next two years or the next 10 years, but ever, because sometimes you really don't want six cursors going on around yours, messing with other parts of the document while you're trying to freaking focus on some really complicated piece of text, right? It just can be annoying as hell. Um, so sometimes you just want to write. You don't want to be distracted by a collaboration, like you, you're trying to do research. So the system needs to support you in doing that. It needs to allow you to say, I'm actually just writing my piece of the document right now, and I don't want anyone to join my session. I'd like to know if something's going on. Uh, I might want to um, poke my head in. This is interesting. This is one of these real-time collaboration annoyances. <laughs> so. I, I, I might want to, to see what's, what's happening, um, but I, I certainly I don't always want to be in that mode. Um, but that creates its own set of challenges. So you, you will have some users who are not um, participating in a session uh, and who might be editing at, at the same time as the others who are. And they might not do that even just because they have um, browsers that don't support it. Um, and while um, browsers uh, always get better, um, for accessibility reasons, it's going to be very hard to make this really overflow with screen readers and some other technologies. Um, so there's likely for a long time, perhaps for uh, an indefinite amount of time, um, some group of users that can participate in this real-time collaboration mode. And there might be reasons why you just don't want to work with people other than wanting to focus. You might not want to work with someone who's not banned, uh, who's not uh, a, a user who's sort of regarded as a bad faith actor. Um, but you still don't feel like working with them at the same time. So what happens if, if you sort of have those situations? Well, then you have that and that scenario that um, I, I tried to illustrate, um, um, that Powell, Powell illustrated um, in, in, in one of the designs where um, what he's showing here is um, this notion that you might have like an edit come into the system um, that's not necessarily visible to the user who's editing the document um, at that time. Uh, so that's an interesting notion. You might have to find a way to make uh, make edits visible and introduce them into the real-time collaboration session um, that uh, that aren't made by people who are actually part of the session. Uh, so that gets very complex uh, very very quickly. Um, then finally, um, there are reasons why I see chat is regarded as unofficial because um, behaviors and and uh, in chat rooms can differ pretty substantially from the kinds of behaviors that you find on like public talk pages. When users just talk to each other, they might do all kinds of things that have nothing to do with an encyclopedia that may behave uh, in completely inappropriate ways on the site. Um, but then uh, uh, there's a need to police those behaviors. There's a need to stop people from um, behaving inappropriately through chat rooms. And so you would have to deal with the consequences of introducing anything like uh, real-time chat into the system um, one way or another. Now, certainly, you uh, want to have some kind of ephemeral um, chat uh, that uh, can take place between two users. Um, but you'd still either just have to live with the risk that uh, some of those users are going to plan a terror attack uh, on the wiki, or, or, or you just have to deal, um, deal with that in, in some other way. And you have to introduce mechanisms to moderate and police that. Um, so it, it gets complicated um, as you introduce these new forms of interactions. And then finally, Wikitext is um, not as powerful as we, we give it credit for. Um, because Wikitext itself is a simplified markup language, it's actually very hard to model certain kinds of complex um, relationship between a document and other um, data structures with, um, within Wikitext without making it completely unreadable. 
Um, you may have noticed, like, has anyone ever um, used um, the uh, sort of translation features that we have on MetaWiki, MediaWiki.org, and um, the Translate extension? Anyone familiar with Translate? With a handful of people. So if, if you've used this um, on the wikis and you translate a document using that software, you sort of insert these translate tags to mark up different parts of the, the, the section that are supposed to be translated. And it messes up the markup and it makes it almost completely unreadable in practice. And uh, that's kind of unavoidable because markup that is readable um, really conflicts with the notion of actually doing these kinds of, um, kinds of things. And when you think of what Google Docs does where you um, select a comment, uh, select a piece of text, add a comment, um, you, you do very complex things with the document, you uh, add annotations to an offset within the document. It's very, very difficult to make these things survive um, in the markup in a way that uh, users who operate at the markup level will understand. Um, it's certainly possible to build a real-time collaboration tool that operates on wiki text. I'm not sure we would want to, um, but it's doable. Um, but the moment you start adding some of that kind of functionality, um, it gets um, gets pretty messy, uh, especially if you sort of want to maintain a commitment to the markup being actually readable and, and easy to understand. At the same time, I think as we saw earlier, there, there are many um, potentially powerful applications for um, this kind of technology. Um, the obvious one is that sort of current event scenario. Um, actually, and I actually think one of the more interesting ones is this sort of social conflicts. Like I do think that as we um, give users this technology, things that currently play, play out as, as these very painful um, conflicts on the wiki because everyone sort of feels the need to articulate an argument in a very compelling way um, because they're writing for like generations to come, like everything is a huge deal. Um, uh, everything becomes like a potential outcome case. <coughs> uh, you, uh, you might find better ways to manage this kind of thing um, if you can talk to people while you're working on, on an article. And you, you might find better ways for users to mentor each other. Um, you might find new, new ways to introduce people to the art of writing really, really high quality articles. Um, that was sort of illustrated earlier in the, uh, in the Ricky project screen shows this notion that you can find mentors, work with them on a document, have them teach you um, the, the art of writing, the craft of writing, as opposed to sort of the technology of writing that we often focus on now. And, and these very targeted collaborations around like a specific topic, the collaboration of the day uh, of the week and editing party, like there are many different ways that you could use this technology. But I think there's, there's going to be some that, um, that we can't really think of right now um, or, or some that will surprise us. I'm curious actually on, around the, the Twitch example, um, who, who's actually watched a video on Twitch in this room? Okay. Um, so. I'm just going to pick you. Uh, do you mind explaining uh, to, um, to other folks what Twitch is? Uh, well, I've only played Pokemon yet, so <laughs> it, has, it has an integrated chat feature. I don't, I'm not really good at explaining it. Someone else want to take a crack at it? Mm -hmm. And you can watch games um, being played by other people, which people do. Um, so <laughs> you, you can go to this website and look at like the popular games that are being played uh, on Twitch TV, and you can hear commentary about like, oh, wow, nice shot. Um, and uh, you, you can, this, I'm clearly not the target audience. Um, <laughs> and, and it's it's it, but it has a target audience. In fact, it has been acquired by uh, by Google slash YouTube for a billion dollars. Uh, so this this isn't uh, this isn't a small thing. Like it's a, it's a really big deal. And like there are people who enjoy watching games as a spectator sport or esport, um, uh, for instance. And this is becoming like its own new cultural medium. And the reason I'm I'm bringing this up here is just because I don't I, I wouldn't be so surprised if the, the sort of act of watching um, the world being documented um, would actually become more interesting and more compelling to more people, especially as we think about like current events um, uh, and, and real world situations unfolding and sort of seeing people talk about them, um, to argue about them, to maybe even use voice and video to do that um, and, and to resolve conflicts and have these virtual newsrooms uh, and, and conversations 
occur um, as, as people work on a Wikipedia article and other resources related um, to something that's happening in real time. I don't think it's so something so implausible that, that this could become its own activity and, and something people just want to do. And as you look and as you watch, you sort of get the motivation uh, to jump in and to join. Um, so I'll leave you with this as, as a last thought. And um, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Scott and Anya. And Scott works on the, um, the Parsoid team, uh, which is the fundamental component that makes the, the visual editor even possible by translating wiki text and HTML back and forth. And Scott has been playing with the technologies that exist today um, to make um, real-time collaboration possible on any website. And one of those technologies is TogetherJS. And I'm going to let him explain how it works. Thank you. And we'll take your thoughts and questions at the end. So I've got a backup laptop there. I'm hoping that I won't have to use it. Um, but the, uh, the side effect is you get to see me log into Wikipedia, which I'm sure is one of the most common things that you've seen people do. Um, my password is six bullets. Um, just so you know, you'll see that, I'm sure. Um, OK, so uh, real-time collaborative editing with TogetherJS. And I'm Scott, and I have an email address at wikimedia.org, because I'm a staff member now. Um, I didn't used to be. so. Uh, I'm also a good person if you ever want to know about um, being a volunteer who contributes to code to, um, to core parts of, Wikime of MediaWiki. Um, oh, edit, edit. Did, you, did you change the slides? No? Uh, well, uh, yeah, this happens a lot, right? Um, and uh, I would like to never have that happen again. It, it will always happen, just the, the um, to give a sort of sense of reality and like, uh, you know, check your assumptions. So even if you do collaborative editing, um, there will be some times when th people make changes that conflict, right? Even if you're using Google Docs, you might be typing in the middle of a paragraph and someone will delete the entire paragraph, right? And it may do something that sort of preserves your text from the middle of the paragraph or something equally interesting. But, you know, um, part of what this is is just shortening the feedback loop, trying to make it Rather than, as, as Eric showed, you just sort of slow motion conversation through commit change messages after every version. Now you can sort of do it interactively, but sometimes you will still have um, conflicts. So the world is not perfect. Um, OK, so here's where I get to try to use this machine and type my six bullets um, twice. So I'm told that if I go up here, I get this fancy Mac stuff. And that somewhere in here, there is Ah, a window for me. So um, that's oops. Um, well, let's 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 start here. <laughs> oh, this is this is oh, this is you logged in. I see. I wanted the other window, right? That's what you were telling me. Can I just log you out? Okay, we'll just do that. Um, Uh, yeah, there you go. Oh, man. I think I might have lied. I think I, it might be more than six bullets. And it's going to ask me if I want. No, I don't want it to double. Oh. Yeah, well, this is it. If you get impatient, I am uh, logged in on my other laptop, but then you have to watch me. There you go. No, don't keep me logged in because it, it will not be me. And don't remember my password. And You're still logging as G4. No, it, I think. It's, it's thinking about it. Look, I'm me. I am me. But no, not now. Don't remember the password. OK. So um, look, this is a browser much like every other browser. Why is this browser different? Well, tonight, um, there's a tab here called Together. Um, and this is uh, the Together.js interface. And because I've never logged in, it's going to tell me a little bit about it so we can watch. And the fonts are a little bit wonky because I um, did something wrong. I know that. Um, it's a service for your website, which lets you collaborate in real time. TogetherJS actually is site agnostic. Um, 
to they've made it general as, as much as possible. Um, and it can take plugins so that any really special stuff that your website does, um, you can add a plugin for. And um, and so, for example, uh, they've got a plugin for code for the Ace Code Editor, which um, we sometimes use on MediaWiki. Um, and you could write a plugin for Visual Editor, for example. Um, oh, I should well, I'll I'll have them tell me about it. Um, so this is kind of boring if it's just me by myself. So now I get to do this whole fun thing again. This time it's an incognito window, so I can be some completely different person. Um, and we're using a yeah. See, this is the yeah. Earlier I learned that this is the disadvantage of negative reputation systems. So that it, it encourages people to just create a new identity. Um, but I created a new identity less than two years ago, and my new identity was um, this. Oops. It has the magic. Um, WMF at the end. <laughs> okay. No, still no. I should have, yeah, if I'd done the incognito window, it would have kept trying to make me you before. Um, and uh, let's play with this a little bit and let's look at both of these at once. I think this is as far as I can make that one. I'll bring this one over here. Yes. Okay. So I apologize for all that part with my witty banner was the part that we'd saved if we'd looked at it literally in my laptop. Um, okay, so right. Uh, so one of the ways is you can find someone. So this is actually a, a kind of key issue for UI for collaboration. And um, Eric mentioned it uh, in his part of the talk. And there's some, some clever um, user interface design for how this might be. But it, it's, it's something that let's just think about for a moment. It's, how do you actually find someone to collaborate with? Um, this one uses an out-of-bound man mechanism. So it just gives me a magic URL and I say, I'm going to communicate that to you somehow on your talk page, over Facebook, with Snapchat. I'm going to take a selfie and post it to Twitter. I don't know. Um, <laughs> selfie of holding this. Oops, that was not the window I wanted to open that time. I'm still there. No, I, did I? Okay. My friend asked me to collaborate with myself. Um, but I think that's fine. I think this is fine too. I think that all. Oh no! Ah, crap! I'm the same person in both sides. Now. <laughs> yeah. The, oh, I see. This is me. Oh, right. Okay. So now I. Now I've got two of myself I'm collaborating with. Well, that, that still works. <laughs> um, uh, so the other interesting thing is uh, TogetherJS has a sort of page following system. So um, one of me, uh, which I'll try to close. For, is it, was that the wrong one that I closed? Yeah. Let's see if it just magically appears. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I still have I still have this other one. Um, top right. And this one, no, this one. This one is me, and I'm collaborating with myself. Great. Well, your computer's gonna be fun later. Um, okay, so uh, and I am logged in, and I'm doing stuff, but I'm on a user page for whatever reason. Um, no, right. Okay, so now I'm in the same place, perhaps, on the same page, and it's all wonderful. Look, I'm on the same page as me. Great! Um, so here, let, let me walk you through some of the, the sort of built-in features of TogetherJS, which you get for free. Um, I can change my name. I've, I've added a little bit of um, code, which synchronizes that with the MediaWiki user system. Um, I can change my avatar. Gee, I wish that there was something to use there. Um, Anyway, I can do that. Um, uh, so this is actually this is a, a, something which has been talked about at uh, at Wikimedia for a while. Is is there a profile picture for people? Should we have one? But not? anyway, this has the opportunity to put that in, but it's not mandatory. I can just be an anonymous person. Um, and the other interesting thing, of course, is there's a built-in chat system, right? So hello there. Oh boy, I'm yelling, and I can say, um, why are you yelling at me? Uh, and it all works. Um, and this is important if we actually collaborate on any kind of reasonable page. We're going to need some out-of-band mechanism other than typing in the thing, which 
happens in Etherpad. If you've ever collaborated on Diffing with Etherpad, it turns into an impromptu chat session or you have a back channel IRC thing to actually talk to the other person. Um, but you need some kind of mechanism to sort of talk about what you're doing. Um, the other interesting thing is it, uh, you can tell it, it um, synchronizes the pointer so you can see what I'm looking at. And if I'm saying, this link here is broken, or this is the article we're going to look at. Um, and it works even though these pages are, are um, laid out differently um, because it uses the HTML element that I'm pointing to wherever that happens to be on the other person's screen, um, which is kind of cute. Um, and this here is a microphone chat, and I'm not going to try to do that with myself. <laughs> That's a little bit too down the rabbit hole. Um, so of course, we're all here because we want to know if we can actually edit source with it. Um, and it should tell me that, oh yes, I'm going to the editing, I'm going to join you in editing this wonderful article. And I'm going to close the chat for now because my windows aren't that wide. Um, oh, right. Yes. So I typed in moon, but in fact, my, uh, my staff account is not a registered uh, user because I did not bother to verify the email address for it. So let's use a different page, which, which, which both me and me can edit. Um, and uh, right, I like I like Moon. Everyone, I think every developer at, at Wikimedia has their favorite article that they test stuff on. Um, for whatever reason, Moon is my favorite article, but it was a terrible example for today. I, I apologize. And I like it because generally, it, because it's a terrible article, like image layout is awful and whatnot, so it, it's a good thing to test PDFs on. Um, okay, so this is an article that I wrote, so it's a wonderful article. Um, well, yeah. And yes, right. I'm going to edit here, and I'm going to join myself editing this article. Yes, I'm on the editing page now. Um, and so this is, you know, here. Boo! And look, it appears over here, or it should. Well, that was exciting. Um, well, yes, it works exactly as well as, um, as demos do. Yeah. Great. Um, <laughs> So this is probably a good segue to the many faults of uh, operational transform systems, which is they work really hard to synchronize two documents, and they generally work fine, except when they don't. And then these two guys think they have the same text, and they have all the same text except for those two letters. Um, so great, that's a great segue to go into the next part of the talk. Would be how about these how these systems work, and um, yeah. I, yeah, I, we'll just say bugs happen when we do demos. That's, that's um, does anyone have any questions before I go into more stuff? Yes, it works just fine. <laughs> I don't. Please don't make me log into some of Yeah, so um, I will get back to you because there's a, a a star right here, and I'll I'll talk about that in a second. So. Um, Moving on briefly, and then we can because then we can address your questions. Um, so there's an extension TogetherJS. Um, it's based on TogetherJS from Mozilla Labs, which I mentioned before. Hey, um, you, you shouldn't have. Anyway, um, <laughs> I won't complain about Mozilla politics. Um, yeah, anyway, that's just just. Sorry, everything to do too. Yeah, exactly. We we can yeah. Um, so uh, as I said, TogetherJS works on any web page, and you're encouraged. You know, right now you can follow people around uh, uh, Wikipedia if you with with because if you're using this extension that, that I've written here, um, you could also add it to your own website. And you could sort of swap off to some other thing. Um, you could. It would be very interesting to try to add spelling on Etherpad too. And, uh, yeah, exactly. Um, so. Uh, the extension um, pretty much just loads together JS from Mozilla. All the changes that need to be made to that to make that work have been merged upstream, and there's a little bit of additional code to, to um, for a visual editor plugin and uh, the account system, like I mentioned. Um, so how does it work? It's magic. Yeah. Mozilla guys, history. Um, okay, go so, on. Um, so it's uh, a fat client and a thin hub. So the, the really interesting thing is that the server-side component of this is really, really, really thin. It's less than 400 lines of node, and I was actually kind of surprised it was even that many. Um, oh, that's that's a baseball player named um, Hub Purdue, uh, just in case you're wondering. And he played for the Boston Braves. We aren't the Boston Braves anymore, but damn. Um, great. Uh, 
So the hub does only exactly one thing, which is take the messages from the clients and give them an order, and then it rebroadcasts them back to everybody. Um, and that turns out to be the only interesting thing that you need to do to make this synchronization work. Um, bugs and demos notwithstanding. Um, so the, the magic part of the operational transform, um, which is, again, not all that complicated in practice. This is probably going to be the shortest description of operational transformation you've ever seen. Um, hopefully it's the only one you've ever seen, but I'm safe in making that claim. Um, okay, so I've got two, two things that I've done to the document. I've got the document and I type foo on one side and I type var on the other. And the job of the operational transformation, if it is correct, is to get me a new document that has both of those applied. But to do it in the following way, I want, I've, I've already written foo over on the left, and I need a transformation that, after I've already written foo, adds bar in the right place. And on the other side, I've already written bar, or I have a pled bold face, and that's the example that's actually on the side. Um, and I want something which, after I've written bar, applies foo in the right place, which in this case is before bar, not halfway in the middle, like in the demo. Um, so that's not too hard. Um, uh, Except that it is, but we'll just we'll wave our hands on that. Um, so the hub's job is, is just responsible for ordering. So everyone sees the same edits, and we can all agree on that. This, again, that's the only purpose of the hub. Now we've solved the hard part. Um, and the edits just say what version uh, of the document they applied to, um, with a little star, because, yeah, I'll talk about the star in a second. Um, and because of that, we can see which of these are inv invalid. So A applied to version 1, right? Everyone agrees on that, that's fine. B applied, sent a change to everyone that also applied to version one, but we already saw A's edit, sorry B, you're too slow. So B's going to resend and update the, the version now, and he says, oh, okay, this is, remember that operational transformation? What he's done is he's, he's done that to his old edit, given A, and now he's got a new B, which will apply after A, but do the same thing, hopefully. Um, and he sends that out and says, B2. And everyone says, yes, we heard B2. We don't have anything else, that's fine. C sends an edit, D sends an edit. A sends an edit, he's really lagged, he sent something that, um, or she sent something that applied back to version three, which you know was ages ago, so we just punt that, everyone says, what are you smoking? And A also sees, receives its own edit, A3, in the same order as everyone else, so he also by this point knows that everyone hates him, um, and updates it twice to get to five, and then sends A5 out. Um, and the star there is because um, you can actually just use the numbers, because we only send, we. B is not going to send B2 until he hears that, that B1 happened right. So he's never going to think, his version 2 is never going to be different from everyone else's 2. By the time he sends out a change labeled that applies to 2, he knows, he's seen A1, he knows that he's got the same version, document version 2 that everyone else does. Um, so that's it, right? Not too hard. Um, so for wiki text edits, which are the simple case that should have worked flawlessly, which is why they of course broke during the demo, um, there's basically three, only three types of things that you can do. I can insert a string of characters, like foo. I could delete a string of characters, which I didn't even try. Or I could replace a string of characters with a different one. I could delete, you know, I could highlight foo and type bar, which deletes foo and adds bar in there. Um, and the, the secret is they're all really the same. I can come up with one replace operation. I can just say replace nothing with, or um, replace this with nothing, and I've only got one operation. So all I have to do is make sure that one operation works, that I've got a, a good operational transformation for that one operation, and Wikitext just works, unless you're giving a demo. Um, Visual Editor was, was designed um, with, uh, with this system in mind, um, but it's a little bit more complicated. It's got uh, linear models and nesting and whatnot, but, but fundamentally for our purposes, uh, it alternates metadata and data, so positions are, are a little bit complicated. Um, and what it, Metadata are things like comments or uh, meta tags, like categories, turn out to be meta tags in, in, in the um, in the Farzoid DOM. And those things you can't see, but you don't want to delete accidentally. So if I if I highlighted something which contained a category tag, but that I couldn't see in Visual Editor, and I type something else, I really just want to move that category tag somewhere else. I don't want to accidentally delete something I can't see. And similarly for the comments. Um, if someone said, please don't do this, and I can't see it, but I do it anyway, I don't also want to delete the comment that said I shouldn't do it because that will make them really, really mad, right? <laughs> um, okay, so I've got this slightly more complicated data structure that has some amount of metadata before every bit of data, of actual visible data. Um, and then there's these 
the, all the things that you can do with it in Visual Editor. So I've already done the, the optimization where insert and delete are just replaced. So everywhere you see replace, imagine that there's actually three operations, which we'll, Rowan and I will talk about later. <laughs> um, so you can replace elements with the linear model, and again, that's either usually moving that metadata someplace else so it's not accidentally deleting it, but you can delete it, and I have no idea why you'd want to do that, but it's in the model. Um, you can replace the metadata uh, in the linear model. If you change the category tag in Visual Editor, it will, it will replace that. Um, I can insert a whole entire document into the middle of my thing, which um, is uh, part of what James talked about with uh, uh, nested trees of Visual Editors where I can edit the template and yeah, magic stuff. Now, edit the wiki text in the template using a sub version of Visual Editor, and then this new document that I created with the other Visual Editor gets smacked in the middle of my stuff. Um, and attributes and annotations, so boldface, italic, um, list style, so it's bold or numbers. Um, so that gives you a little idea of um, why this could be hard. Um, and I think, realistically speaking, just tell yourself, I showed you a flawless demo, right, just now. <laughs> There's no bugs at all. But even then, before this can actually be deployed, um, thanks. Uh, it really needs to be banged on a lot to make sure that all the possible combinations of these transactions will still result in a sane document state. So again, th this is a bit of realism to sort of mentally adjust for the intensive testing there. Um, okay, so uh, just make it work. Well, you just go to extension together JS and it just works, except I've hacked visual editor to pieces. So, um, and it's not actually deployed in English Wikipedia, but it's a lot more fun to use on, on real Wikipedia. Um, <laughs> So you could just use a, with a user script instead, which answers somebody's question about um, why it wouldn't work on their machine, because you don't have that user script. But you can just insert that into your common JS, and I promise I won't do anything evil. Um, uh, <laughs> and, um, and of course, your friends have to do this as well if they actually want to collaborate with you. OK, I'm giving you five seconds to, to copy that down. I think it's at the end, maybe. Um, so. Um, Open questions, Eric uh, touched on most, most of these. Um, one is, you know, how do you actually find the other editors? Um, uh, and the other, somewhat related, um, what is, uh, is user groups. Does Wikipedia need some notion of a group of editors? So we've got sort of wiki, wiki projects right now, which are kind of a group of users, right? If, if I want to edit the article on the moon, do I want to have some way of saying other people I know who are interested in the moon article? Um, is that just watch list, is that the previous history of the page? Um, do I want social groups, right? Um, uh, yeah, do we come Facebook? That's, that's the next one. Um, uh, as Eric mentioned, how, how to record or display. So I just did this collaborative editing. If I do it with TogetherJS, one of us has to hit the save button, and that person gets credit for all the good or bad that we did in our session. Um, we like to record that in a, in a more granular, granular way, but that is a, a somewhat longer term project. Um, Parzoid, if you were here for the Parzoid talk this morning, which was great, um, Parzoid has uh, stable element IDs that sort of will persist some information about this particular piece of the document um, at a finer grain level than the entire revision, uh, and that would be useful for that. Um, also, one of us has to hit save. Which one of us is it, right? Do, is the page, should we save the page when the last person who was in our session is done? How do we vote? Like, how do we decide when we're done? Um, and the social impact. Uh, someone, again, I'm, I'm like recapping the talks which I personally went to throughout uh, Wikimania, which is probably a different context from the rest of you, but the talk I went to just before this session uh, was in the, uh, the main auditorium, and someone mentioned uh, how there were laws of physics in code, and one of the laws of physics about uh, MediaWiki was that it was not real time, that it was asynchronous, I did something and then someone else did something and we didn't do, do all, all together. So there's a lot of kind of social stuff which changes when that happens, when I can actually talk to people in real time, you know, like I said, finding friends, do I need, do I need friend groups now so I know when they're online? Um, uh, do I need circles of people who are interested in the moon article who are different from the people who are interested in square dancing or whatever? Um, and do you inter inadvertently become Facebook, right? You keep adding features to this social side, or is there a way that we can efficiently outsource that and tie into 
you know, maybe there's a button that says invite all my friends from Facebook to our, read this article, or invite, sorry, invite all people from my Google Plus circle, which is a little bit more granular maybe. Um, so these are, these, are, um, these are questions that we need to think about seriously because they do influence the social aspect of our community. You know, to some degree, to the extent that we embrace a change in editing, we're going to embrace, they were going to affect how people um, interact with the Wikipedia. Uh, another related issue is um, one of the things that we'd like to do and the uh, UI designs show in a number of different places is make the community more visible behind the article so that when I'm reading the article I know that there were people who wrote that and who might be working on it right now right and if I want to enable a real-time collaboration I have to both see that people are working on it right now and hopefully be able to join them um, but that other voices in the community would like Wikipedia to be a sober canonical reference um, and they don't like the idea that dorkface587 just edited the page, right? <laughs> to the extent that you make visible that dorkface587 is editing, who might be a well-respected trusted editor, and I should have checked that's not a taken username, um, <laughs> you know, so uh, these are the discussions we have to have in, in, in order to sort of move forward with this and figure out um, how we can strike the right compromises. Um, so I have five minutes, I was just told, which is hopefully enough time for some questions and discussion. Um, so, have at it. Sure. So what's the prognosis then? Are we going to get real time editing at any time soon? Um, so, you can install my user script and you have that right now. I, I honestly, that's not entirely a prestigious answer. I feel like the best real solution is to do experiments that gradually get more and more accepted. Um, but the TogetherJS stuff is not quite as stable as I'd like to do, but it is one of my goals in the very short term to make it stable enough that people can start playing with it and come up with their own answers. Like maybe we don't need user groups because maybe people do use Facebook to find people who want to, to collaborate with them on editors or, or, you know, or maybe this grows into flow. But um, I feel like the best way to do it is, is to try things out. Um, and I, you know, this is actually the first user script I wrote. Um, and I really like user scripts now. Usually I don't like user scripts because they break things when we try to deploy things. But, um, you know, we have user scripts and gadgets and beta features, a lot of nice ways to do it. Um, and, uh, and I think we'll probably get better interaction with the community if we don't propose this as, some, as the new way that Wikipedia is, at least not at first. Um, but, you know, new ways that, that people who are interested in real-time collaboration with friends can, can, uh, can try out. Answer your question, and of course, if Eric says it, it's actually canonical. I'm, you know, this is just my opinion. <laughs> so, uh, do I think if any consider using or automatically adding it to the uh, edit summary to automatically add all the collaborating content? Yeah. So um, one of the things which Scott, repeat the question. Oh, sorry. Um, the question was, uh, should should you just automatically add all the collaborating users to the user summary? Um, and uh, this is because this is like my third or fourth spare time project at Wikimedia, um, in addition to like PDF rendering and all sorts of other things. Um, uh, I didn't do a lot of integration work here, um, uh, and I was mostly interested in, in making sure that visual editor transaction stuff, which I glossed over because there's still some bugs there, and I didn't feel completely safe demoing that, especially since just plain text editing was broken. Um, uh, I've lost my train of thought. Oh, um, so yeah, so the when I first saw um, some house designs for collaboration, it made me think, well, you know, can I hack them? I think it would be a very interesting project to take um, something like Winter, which is designed for UI experimentation, and integrate, t uh, integrate uh, together JS a little bit more into that and see to what extent, um, and again, the actual core of TogetherJS, the part that does the interesting, so, I mean, so there's two parts. The, the actual real-time OT stuff is not all that big, other than the fact that it's really hairy and has lots of corner cases. Um, the uh, chat and some other features are things which you could re-implement if you wanted to. It didn't. This would be like the fourth or fifth chat system which I implemented, so I had no personal appetite to like integrate chat by re-implementing a chat system um, from scratch. 
But there's a lot of things which could be better integrated, right? So, so edit summaries are definitely one. Um, and this would get kind of my question, like how do we decide when we're done? Like maybe you add a button that says I'm done and when everyone involved in the session or everyone still involved in the session has clicked it, then it gets saved. Right, and then if you use the MediaWiki API for it, it could also automatically add the list of people who are in it. That would be, you know, this is kind of the, do you want to try to implement new designs with something like, you know, that, or do you want to just do something easy that, that works? Um, I would like to see more experimentation. Um, That one. Okay, I'll leave it up there. <laughs> yes? Uh, I was wondering whether there's any uh, necessity for a notion of done. You know, if you sort of get into a real time space, with, um, a content more or less starts usually but more like a chat, the, the delineation starts to disappear. Yeah, so um, I think we, it, it was covered in Eric's side, but we certainly discussed it a lot internally. This sort of notion of, especially if there are, um, real-time and non-real-time editors active at the same time uh, who could potentially step on each other. How do you handle that? Um, so uh, certainly Google Docs, for example, uses, uh, well, a number of systems before that, but this is the one you're, people are familiar with right now, uses this notion that if the change has been left alone for long enough, it commits. Um, and that, that's fairly common for that. Um, in a, so for the media, in the Wikimedia context, um, if my group was done with it and we all left the page and then someone else saved a new version before enough time had been done that it decided we were done, like then you could get commits after the fact, which would be kind of bad. So I think there's a real, um, uh, there's a real thin line. I think that's one of the things which is going to be novel about how this plays out with MediaWiki is that we're going to actually have um, both uh, collaborative and non-collaborative sessions active at the same time inevitably and we're going to have to figure out how that actually works. Yes. Um, Eric kind of skimmed over some stuff about Wikibook, uh, yeah, Wikibook projects and integration into the um, interface. Is that part of the plan? Well, that's, that, that, that's, that's something we've been discussing, I guess, right? So, you know, I asked the question, do we need a broader notion of user groups? I, Seems like it seems like a bad idea to say we can't do any more work until we completely revamp user groups. I think wiki projects are something which exists already, which might be our first approximation for that. Right? Yeah, and and so we, we try to avoid making too explicit plans that go out like two, three, four years and say, oh, yeah, that, this is what what um, we will have in 2016. Um, if, if you want that sort of kind of vision, um, yeah, we, we, we sometimes um, share these kinds of designs to sort of articulate what could it look like. But probably the future is, is going to be totally different. What we're, we're doing now in the near term is exploring some notion of like better understanding um, who users are and how they relate to each other. And what, what I mean by that is um, as you make edits, uh, you're basically telling um, the site, uh, some things about yourself implicitly, like you're editing an article um, and uh, you're implicitly telling the site, oh, I care about this subject, I care about this domain. You're not saying this, but you're sort of implying it to being active in certain parts of, say, Wikipedia. Um, you only edit articles about airplanes as well. Um, there's a good chance that you're the kind of person who might want to collaborate with other people who want to edit those articles. Now, whether that should lead to an invitation to join a wiki project that's dedicated to that, or whether that should just, um, in the UI, show you the other users who share similar interests, or whether that should focus on suggesting specific articles rather than people um, that relate to that domain, I think we need to test a lot of those ideas and see which ones actually drive long-term engagement. I think it's interesting to look at some other sites and some other models to, to see what those um, those folks have, uh, have built. Uh, Quora is a very interesting example to look at. Um, it's not exactly a runaway success, but it has its niche um, for um, being a question and answer site. Um, and when you when you sign up there, um, it sort of sort of helps you uh, discover other people who uh, share the same interest um, very very quickly without you having to very explicitly. 
say anything to that effect. And so we're looking right now into these kinds of recommendation and personalization uh, engines um, that we will use uh, initially for more transactional task suggestions. Would you like to edit X? Maybe you would like to work on Y and which could potentially lead into more affiliation oriented functionality that helps you on a persistent basis form a connection with other users that share those interests. What Eric is saying is the first time you visit Wikipedia, it will show you a list of 50 people that you know and you have to click on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think we have only time for like one more question. I'd like to take someone from the back of the room because I feel like I neglect the back of the room. Is there anyone? Sure, speak up loudly. Okay, uh, I uh, I was just gonna suggest that one context in which, like the context in which I've done real time editing, which I think this would be really useful and usable right now, would be in edit-a-thons. Um, also, where you have uh, edit conflicts are relatively rare because you're all sitting around. Um, and I've done a lot of real time editing in things like Etherpad or Google Docs, but usually on new articles which are being created and doing it with existing articles is a pain. Um, so this sounds great. The challenge there is that very often this is in the process of teaching new users to edit. And so having very good documentation on how to get something like this set up um, would be important or maybe some way of helping, I mean, maybe better documentation than alternatively add import script to something <laughs> like that, right? Uh, um, so so uh, maybe that would be a, a useful thing because I think that there are contexts like edit where this would be really, really useful. Yeah, I, I'd like to say, I mean, I, I was kind of advocating for continued experimentation. I think things like edit are great places to continue to experiment with all these questions, yeah, uh, I, groups I think and whatnot. The ability also to have a person like like show the mouse and say, I'm going to click here and actually watch someone else do it is something which is not necessarily part of the real time editing thing, but in the context of like sort of teaching someone to edit Wikipedia could be enormously useful. Mm -hmm. um, it's not something you highlighted in your talk, but as I was watching it, I, that, I, that struck me as super useful. So maybe that's something we can think about writing some documentation around what you've already done uh, to help use that if we can give feedback and, as this tool develops. Yeah, and just, just to be honest, like the user script stuff I hacked between like 9 a.m. this morning and today. So yes, it's not really well documented. <laughs> um, uh, I think we should wrap up, but I think this is the last one in the session, so you can just come up and pull our ear later. Oh, Lila's keynote is in eight minutes, so you can talk to me for eight minutes or, or Eric as we walk the, <laughs> the keynote. Thanks a lot. Today's session, as you can see, Lila has a keynote starting in eight minutes. There will also be food from seven and entertainment from eight. Thank you, everyone.
so I'll find it. Uh, yeah. Cool. Yeah, man. So, uh, yeah. Like, version.